Thank you so much for coming to hear me talk about the mathematics of thought, something that, is, uh, that interests me very much in my research. And the basic question I'm asking myself is, how does mathematics shape our conceptualization of reality? Now, you might think, well, in some sense, there is a really trivial answer to this. And this is because mathematical methods are actually everywhere, especially in the empirical sciences. For example, in physics, um, physical theories couldn't be formulated without the use of mathematics. But also in other uh, natural sciences, for example, in biology, we use mathematical models in order to study the behavior of uh, certain, um, well, patterns of organisms. And in sociology, we use mathematics in order to study social networks. So in that sense, mathematical methods are everywhere in the empirical sciences. And because the empirical sciences shape the way we see reality, well, naturally, mathematics has a part in that as well. And this is because it is an indispensable scientific tool. But this is not what I'm interested in in my research. I'm more interested in mathematics as a philosophical paradigm. And in order to give you an idea of what that means, I'm going to um, introduce five examples from the history of philosophy to you. So the first one, of course, is Plato, who considered mathematical knowledge the highest form of knowledge. Uh, and in fact, tradition has it that he had the sentence, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here, engraved on top of the entrance to his academy. So he thought that proficiency in mathematics was a prerequisite for the acquisition of any further knowledge whatsoever. Galileo um, had a slightly different view. He believed that, uh, that mathematics was the language of the book of nature. And he thought that it was the scientist's task to become proficient in that language and thereby study the fundamental structures of reality. Also, Kant had a very special place in his philosophy for mathematics. So he thought that mathematics is a prime example for a particular class of human judgments, judgments he called uh, judgments synthetic a priori. And those are judgments that are, on the one hand, we form without consulting uh, our experience beforehand. But on the other hand, they're not empty judgments like analytical judgments, but we actually get to learn something new in those judgments. And he thought that mathematics was the prime example of synthetic a priori judgments and that we could learn how these judgments work in different contexts. Also, Nietzsche believed that uh, mathematics actually is a paradigm of refinement and rigor. And he uh, thought that all other sciences should strive to be as much as possible like mathematics in that respect. And then finally, and perhaps most bizarrely, and so this is why it's my favorite uh, example, Georg Cantor, probably one of the most important mathematicians of all time, at least I think so, um, who proved that there are infinities of different sizes. Um, so there is the infinity of the natural numbers. And he proved, with an actu actually with a very straightforward and simple proof, that um, the set of real numbers is larger than the set of natural numbers, even though both are infinitely large. And so he, in, he called these, number, these sizes of infinities transfinite numbers. And the idea of an absolute infinite, he thought, was a manifestation of God. So Cantor actually found something divine in mathematics. In order to give you a, a slightly better picture of what fascinates me about this, I'm going to say a few words about the relationship between mathematics and the empirical sciences and how this relationship has evolved over time. And again, I'm going to start in ancient Greece. And so for the ancient Greeks, I'm talking now about Plato, the Pythagoreans, and most, most of all, of course, Euclid, um, mathematics was above all. It was where the, it was the only source of true knowledge, uh, of absolutely certain knowledge. Whereas our beliefs about the empirical world were considered to be mere opinions. Why? Because the empirical world is constantly in flux. It's constantly changing. And so he thought, well, it's impossible to have certain knowledge about something that is ever changing. So what we see here is that mathematics is the sort of the kind of knowledge above all. And the empirical world is something we can have opinions about, but not really know anything about. 
a very, very distinct separation between the two realms. Now, this picture changed dramatically during the times of the scientific revolution, many centuries later, when empirical sciences really started to blossom and the exploration of the empirical world started to become more and more systematic. So now we've arrived at a picture where mathematics, as I mentioned earlier, was considered the language of the book of nature. And the task of the scientist was considered to, uh, well, learn the language and figure out the, the basic laws according to which the universe is structured. And these laws were thought to be mathematical laws. So by putting mathematical laws in relation to our observations, um, we, the scientist was supposed to understand the fundamental truths of reality. This picture changed again uh, in the 19th century, the time we now call empiricism. So during that time, um, the fortunes of mathematics were completely reversed again. The empiricists, for example, of the Vienna Circle believed that mathematics actually didn't have any content of its own. It's a mere tool, a very useful tool for the empirical sciences, but a mere tool nevertheless. And the only source of certain well-grounded knowledge was considered to be uh, the empirical sciences. So, as you have noticed, we have sort of this movement where mathematics started off as being this highest form of knowledge, then it sort of merged with the empirical sciences, and then the empirical sciences became our paradigm of well-grounded knowledge, and mathematics was considered to be a mere tool for, uh, for the sciences. And another way of saying, saying this is that mathematics um, started off as something that could be called the language of God. Actually, the ancient Greeks believed that um, the reason that we find sort of imperfect geometrical figures in the empirical world is because the gods gave um, geometry to the world, sort of instilled geometrical language in nature in order to make us understand that uh, this nature is an intelligible, uh, uh, an environment um, that is intelli intelligible to us. During the scientific revolution, then mathematics became the language of nature and during empiricist times, it had become or taken a fall down to uh, the level of a mere language of man. And what we see here, what I want to point out to you, is a continuous dissociation of mathematics from the physical world. And the crossover point that I mentioned earlier coincides roughly with the rise of pure mathematics. So in the 19th century, mathematical concepts that had little or even no physical meaning whatsoever started to be introduced by mathematicians as legitimate objects of mathematical study. For example, n-dimensional spaces, uh, transfinite numbers, non-Euclidean geometries, complex numbers, all these mathematical objects that didn't have any clear physical meaning anymore. And so mathematics in that sense moved beyond concepts that were suggested directly by our experience of physical reality. And so at the beginning of the 20th century, the situation was as follows. I'm going to quote Morris Klein here, perhaps the most important or the most well-known historian of mathematics. He writes it very nicely. The circle within which mathematical studies appeared to be enclosed at the beginning of the 19th century, that circle being applicability to the physical world was broken at all points and mathematics exploded into a hundred branches, each one built on its own system of axioms. So that's actually a very vivid picture of what happened to mathematics. It exploded into these all these different subfields and people working in these different subfields wouldn't necessarily talk much to people working in other mathematical subfields. And of course, you're probably expecting this there was yet another paradigm change. In the, in the first half of the 20th century, set theory, um, one branch of mathematics, uh, uh, all of a sudden acquired a lot of importance. And this was because a group of French mathematicians, they were working under the, under the sort of pen name uh, Bourbaki group, started to prove that set theory is actually a foundation for all of mathematics. They showed that um, we can express all mathematical theorems in the language of set theory, 
which of course made visible the interconnections between all these different branches of mathematics. It also helped precisify certain concepts that had hitherto been slightly vague or unclear. Um, it made visible the fundamental assumptions that were being made in all the different branches of mathematics. And most importantly, it provided a unified framework, a unified language in which all the different branches of mathematics could be interpreted. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.